All right, guys, welcome back to the Fitness in Philosophy podcast. Today, we're going to be discussing business ethics and fitness. James, how are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. I'm still warm from my exercise session, uh, so I'm feeling good. Good. Gain, sustain, pain? I did gains. You know, the, the listeners can't tell, but uh, it'd be, it should be obvious. That aura just radiates off you? From well, yeah, you, you know, the... The high, you know, the blood, blood flow, yeah, the periphery, you know, but listeners would never know. <clears throat> they can't see those arms on audio. No, but you can feel it. Yeah. If you'll feel it in the tone today. You can sense it. There's an energy. Yeah. <laughs> this is an interesting point. I only do gain before these podcasts. Interesting. This would be an interesting uh, long-term study to see my tone and temperament post sustain uh and that actually that makes complete sense based on what you said on uh wednesday about tuesday thursday and saturday being the um ideal sustain days so i mean friday would have to be well day. accepted right i yes. mean it wasn't surprising when i said that Fact. <laughs> no one does no one does cardio on fridays oh come on <laughs> Gosh. Um, anything new in your world? Anything going on? Uh, well, just about to mention, um, because I thought uh, us getting on right at the crack crack here. Um, I'm heading to California next week. We're on. Uh, well, probably people listening will be past that, but we uh go to California around the the beach cities or the coast. Um, every break. Um, we do that. Uh. Uh, on the other side of the continent too, uh, for Florida during winter break. Um, so we're looking forward to that. Spend some time with the girls and and uh, just hanging out. We got lots of lots of fun things scheduled. Uh, the main one, which is which is of uh, interest and more current, is um, they want to they want to try. You know, I did have a little part to play in this. They want to try. Uh, to see what kind of uh, like gymnastics, body weight slash Cirque du Soleil things we can do against one another that creates workouts at the beach for us. Oh, cool. Yeah, we got into it last time because this is the funny way we found out about it. When you fall from up really high, it's not that hard. <laughs> I know you're probably laughing, right? Like, yeah, it's the beach. But um this is funny things that never try, you never try them elsewhere, like in your living. Well, you tried it with your brother, right? <laughs> in the living room. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, anyway, so, you know, cause I, I did the beef. I used the, uh, you know, I used to use Leanne for carries and I used them for carries and presses and all kinds of stuff for my own thing. And uh, anyways, we're going to experiment with that. So I'll, I'll get back to you on it, but that's top of mind. That's cool. Yeah. So, so Cal again. Yes, uh, Mission. Okay. We do the Mission Bay Area, uh, just north of San Diego this time. Cool. Uh, we've been up and down, but uh, yeah, that's a place we like. Very cool. Yeah. I'll be back in Orange County in a couple weeks, around the end of March. Oh, cool. To that. See family? Yep, see family. Solid. Yeah. What's happening in uh, the your neck of the woods for... Um, temperature start with that how's the what's the weather like over there well it, i mean it was just kind of a normal uh indiana winter uh on saturday all of a sudden it was like 70 and people were like out in shorts and barbecuing and like literally as i speak it's it's snowing so got it yeah yeah but you all know that's the case right so that's why you get out with your shorts on yeah i mean that time of year because you're like oh man we're getting a snowstorm soon <laughs> Yes, right. it's like, uh, yeah, someone's hit like a stopwatch and like everyone's like biking, hiking, trying to get out as much as they can and then yeah. back to the door, so. Do you have a lot of snowfall in the winter? Um, Depends on the year, but I, I mean, okay. I, I would say a pretty decent amount. We get, uh, I think South Bend's a little bit unique. We get what's called like a lake effect. So just because of where we are in relation to like Chicago, we get like Lake Michigan right there. Uh, right. We a, a lot of... I think, except for like Buffalo or something like that, yeah. we're 
we're pretty high up there. So like the rest of Indiana, like gets snow, but like maybe not the same as us. Yeah, I got it. I used to determine if people had winters by if you if people drove skidoos to school all year. If you if you don't do that, then I don't call it a winter. That was my cutoff for what a winter is. Yeah, we're 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 definitely not at that level. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I you know you can call it winter, but I didn't call it winter. Yeah. Um, like I was telling you on the knowledge series about the, I went and did some more research on it. The Inuit actually on the East Coast, Northern Labrador have like 25 different uh, actual specific words and languages for different kinds of snow. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so, um... Wow. <laughs> it's, that's the, the, that your face was my brain when I first thought yeah. about it. And I knew there was like multiple different versions, right. And like yeah. kinds and descriptions and et cetera, but it's a, it's a, it's a high number. Yeah. No, that's, that's crazy. I know. Anyways, I mean, we... That, I mean, that is like a, I mean, just as a aside for people who are interested, like that is a philosophical conversation. Not, not that I'm going to take it, but just to yeah, make yeah. you aware, like how do our concepts carve up the world? Yeah. And how do, how, do different, how do different cultures carve up um, mm. uh, different, you know, uh, concepts? Like um, I'm forgetting Willard Van Orman Quine was a famous philosopher at, at Harvard. And he, um, I think the term he used was like Gava guy. And it was supposed to mean like rabbit in this particular tribal language. But how do we know it's not like rabbit hopping? Do you know what I mean? Like how, how yes. do we carve up the concepts of yeah. what this all is? So just... Just yeah topic super interesting oh for sure for sure i do love that yeah i do love that and the philosophy Anyways, question, it's always yeah. beneficial oh yeah definitely. when i pause and think about those kind of things right it creates a tremendous uh curiosity you know for for uh the time you know people spent around a fire you know <laughs> right <laughs> where they weren't flicking through tiktok but they were these long ass conversations for coming up with these, these rules of engagement towards the white stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah. I guess when you don't have TikTok, you got to figure out you know, 26 different words. For hey man, there's, there's 25 ways of going about this. <laughs> yeah. And the philosophical question, the way, the way it's phrased in philosophy, if you ever heard, hear anyone say this is, are our concepts and our language carving nature at its joints? Meaning like, um, mm are these words or concepts actually um, getting at the reality or are they, you know, imposing different categories upon which there, you know, there isn't really a, a difference in the things. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That helps me uh, create better language for when I say fitness is downstream from culture, you know, is fitness, you know, possibly to ripping it in its practice you know, breaking apart the joints of that culture that it seems to be upstream from, you know, that's the way I just thought about that. So that's a new way of thinking about that. But yeah, that's super interesting. Mm -hmm. How well, do we move from snow to business I, 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 ethics? I, 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 mean, I don't have a segue there. I hey, just, uh, okay. Snowmobiles are sold, you know? It's true. Uh, there used to be, uh, you know, I don't know how I'm going to, move this from a into a capitalism you know conversation but uh, are there ethics around selling snowmobiles a whole nother episode yeah a whole nother episode, whole nother episode. <laughs> <laughs> you know i'm sure there's some purist uh, sled doggers or dog sledders i never knew how that what order that went in anyways um Believe it or not, we had, you know, two huge races in Labrador and uh, followed. I did a rod for many, many years based upon the culture. I had friends who did it and know about the, you know, uh, you know, that was the form of uh, transportation. And then, you know, those purists inside of that, that would say probably that uh, to get across land or, you know, to to transport oneself in a northern hemisphere. You should just have a vehicle. You should, be, you should be born with a vehicle, or the state should provide a vehicle. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, property ownership and stuff would be an interesting podcast. Well, another another uh, sequitur, I guess it's called. Uh, we could have another, you know, hypothetical podcast. Yeah. You know, 
30 episodes deep because it would take, I'd say 30 to really complete it and make sure it's robust and full on the ethics of skidooing. Yeah, and just, man, you could do a lot in there. Um, it actually exists, I know it exists, you know. And that's the one that becomes like uh, the true detective or the true crime, yeah. you know what I mean? That, that's yes. the one that- Yes, <laughs> that yeah. the- we're six years down the road, some, <laughs> some Hollywood director is just traveling up north to catch, to catch fish or something. And, and this guy from Newfoundland, uh, uh, which I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bastardize the, the thing, but uh, he's like, oh, yeah, buddy, I got a podcast. <laughs> and he's like, well, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm talking about skidoos, buddy. I'm getting across the land, you know. Uh, anyways, uh, and he digs into it. He's like, it's a gold mine. <laughs> this is a gold mine. Yeah, so. Anyways, we may, we may lock that one in and then just let it let it go out there, Whoosh, just push it out and see what see what one picks up. I'd have to do a big practice though of my, my native tongue and uh, my native accent. I have to bring that back. I'd have to be drunk, so that could be fun too. Thirty episodes of me drunk, hard drunk, like just comprehensible drunk. Wherever that synapse is between like intelligence and the awe of like close to being drunk and like complete stupidity the podcast would be done right on that <laughs> right on that level <laughs> 30 times i think you could handle it that would be amazing to hear like original canadian accent james yeah because um, yeah. it would come out and i would have to do it late at night because when i'm tired and um have had alcohol I go right back to 18 years old in a cabin in Northern Labrador with my buddies. That's what happens. Have you ever heard of or seen Letter Kenny? Oh, come on. I it's wasn't sure. Okay. Yeah. It's close to Trailer Park Boys, which is close to Hockey Night in Canada, which is close to a Sherwood hockey okay. stick. So it's, okay. yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Because, yeah. When, when but someone... I'm glad you mentioned it because yeah. someone will press the 15 second rewind a couple of times there just to make sure they get it. And uh, all I'll say was, is you're welcome. You're welcome that uh, Robbie put you put you into that. Yeah, when some, someone and if you're and let's say this, if you're if you did if you didn't enjoy that little uh, little sidewinder piece of information, you may not you may not be a part of our crew. You're not in our tribe. I mean, we we I'm hate okay to do that, that, right? We hate to go us them, but. If you don't find that stuff humorous, man, I don't know. Are you really trying to get like some real big knowledge buckets from this? I mean, it's basically, it's basically you and me and our characteristics that everyone's here for. Like, I would, I, I, I would be okay with, I would be okay with saying that. There was, yeah, there was like a, the husband of someone at the gym thought I would find it funny and like easily, easily one of like the top comedies I've, I've ever like just amazing. Just, just amazing. <laughs> if you if you can't laugh at stuff like that, like what 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 if what is even the point? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's amazing. It's still one of my favorite shows. Well, that's a whole other. There you go. There's a whole other thirty episodes on. I'm not sure where it would fit into the philosoph philosophical umbrella, but where does satire slash political correctness slash the Joker slash the, like where does that fit into, philosophy? You know, where does that fit into? Because I mean, dude, we could have we could have 180 episodes three times a week for the past four years, right? We could have on culture and satire and fitness. We could. Like, I mean, like I've said that in CCP numerous times, like like someone like Brandon, right? I was like, dude, you could have a career that's 150 years long <laughs> on the satire you could do in fitness, right? Like you could be nonstop 18 hours a day and just go to sleep to wake up to do another 18 hours straight <laughs> of work inside of that, you know? Yeah, I think I remember you saying at one point, like JP Sears before he went down the uh, yeah. certain rabbit hole could, could have easily done fitness and health. Yes. Just, just, yeah. 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 I mean, um, yeah, just on that point, it's uh, uh, for JP, it's uh, uh, he could have stuck with it longer. Like he could have had lots of, but you know, to, to argue, you know, you're not, you're not going to go from, you know, probably a, a million views, quote unquote, in fitness to, uh, 
to uh, you know 10 million views um, in those uh, controversial areas. You know, right? That's true. Yeah. Last little nugget I'll leave, and then uh, and then we'll we'll head into it. Um, but just so people can ponder it in in connection with your question about what is the connection between humor and philosophy. Yeah. Uh, um, a bunch of them, but like. I think the central one that sticks out for both, just two different ways of tackling it, pulling out implicit assumptions of culture and questioning them, one analytically mm -hmm. and one humorously. Right. Um, but yeah, definitely a connection there. Yeah, so. for sure. Yeah, thank you. No problem. I need have a way in for that. All right. So today we are going to discuss business ethics and um, fitness and I like the pause because that's the order of operations. Yeah. And I mean, whether you've ever heard of the term business ethics before or not, I guarantee that if you're in the fitness business, you've probably, I would, I would imagine most people have given some of the questions we're going to ask some thought. Uh, uh, we'll get oh. there. I don't think so. No. I didn't really plan. Yeah, I don't think so. But we'll get there. I, I, we'll stew around with that one. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's let's talk about where this even comes from, from like a broad philosophy perspective. So in philosophy, there, there are kind of three levels of, of ethics. Now you don't need to like know all three of these, but just, just to give you a sense of like the general landscape that we're in to situate what, where business ethics sits. So there's something called meta ethics, which is higher level questions about ethics itself. So where does morality come from? What's its source of justification? What makes it different from other types of claims like scientific religious or aesthetic. So in meta ethics, we're not asking questions about, is this thing right? Or is this thing wrong? We're asking questions about the enterprise and morality itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, I really, I really, besides the fact that meta ethics is very current. <laughs> is there such a thing as meta ethics in that, in that, in that sense, right? I knew yeah. you were going to go there. Um, I just love, I love saying it. I, you sound very intelligent when you say that for the non-philosopher types. You know, um, well, that's a very meta ethical area of conversation. You know? I don't know. That's why I like it. I'm glad you laid it out that way, though, because it did actually help me understand that I generally want to personally get into ethical conversation. Because I, I want I'm like, oh, what's right, what's wrong, you know, find an answer, be curious and like try to dig in on the things that you think are really, you know, and that in itself is a is an ethical conversation. And then the things underneath it, which you'll get to explain, would be particular areas of interest, which is applied ethics for those particular things. But the way you've laid it out, I did it in like a Russian doll format where, you know, applied ethics is something that's really specific that, you know, to, uh, to the examples you're going to give, like, is, uh, should McDonald's, <laughs> I don't know what I thought of this one. Fast food ethics. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh man, you know, that's a, spe <laughs> that's a specific one. Um, you know, and then the, you know, ethics is, you know, uh, just above that. And then meta would be the areas that I think uh, I need to do a lot more time of really. Cause I think if I, if I understood that, then I would understand going into the ethical points, like a better base support of why I'm actually going after this right or wrong scenario, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, it's, it's so it's helpful the way you're categorizing it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and I mean, it's uh, yeah. Sometimes I think framing it in that way or having that structure, you know, um, hierarchy can be helpful. And you know, philosophers tend to think of things that most of us take for granted as like weird. It's in, and that's kind of where the meta ethical project comes from. Of like, hey, wait a second. Ethics isn't and morality isn't quite like science. It isn't like you do an experiment and then you find out oh, stealing is wrong. So like. Where does this come from? Is it religion? Is it uh, it's certainly not science? Is it is it you know folk knowledge? Like where does it come from? What's its source of justification? So that those type things. It's obviously chimpanzees. Yes. Yeah. There you go. It's obviously where it comes from. And the Neuralink. Yeah, we just see what they're up to. Yeah, pretty much. Um, ethics underneath that is probably what most people who have ever you know if you've ever taken a philosophy course or you know, just discuss the topic. This is probably what most people are familiar with, you know, basically the study of what we should and shouldn't do. So probably the two most famous central moral rules here that we've discussed in previous episodes are treat other humans as ends, never merely as means. That's, that's Kant. 
Um, that's a general moral principle from which pretty much all the rest of morality can almost fall out. Or utilitarianism maximize the greatest happiness for the greatest number uh, of people. So um, you know, don't lie, don't steal, don't murder, and almost anything you would else you would want out of morality, for the most part, will come out of that. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I just people may have recognized what I've uh, heard in language around here. You can tell me if I'm right or wrong on that. Is you may have heard uh, what is the ethical thing to do here? in numerous different situations, right? Uh, you know, even the background meetings of, I was just thinking Wall Street, you know, or uh, um, some big decisions at government level, you know, background stuff, right? It's never really on social media what people talk about, but I'm sure they say those things, right? Um, you know, invasions in Libya, I'll just use that because it'd be something that people may have to do some research on baseball, but like, what's, what's the ethical thing to do, right? I think that's where, you know, that, that uh, term or that uh, statement may have been heard for people in this area. <laughs> oh yeah, and uh, I don't know why I'm forgetting the name of it right now, but speaking of business ethics, I'm watching uh, Hulu has a great show with Amanda Seyfried and William H. Macy about uh, Theranos. And right. the whole thing right. is based around, yeah. well, you know, move great fast and, and move fast and break stuff works when you're maybe you're making a social media site and it's like, well, and, and then that runs it into its own issues. Yeah. Now when we're diagnosing uh, prostate cancer or, uh, you know, an autoimmune disease and you're saying like, you know, we're going to sell this and, you know, what's the level of precision like, and are we lying to people? You know, that, that type stuff is yeah very relevant. Really, really great example. And just because you did it, I'm going to add something to it that'll, uh, open up people's minds. Uh, Start listening to Tristan Harris's podcast, Your Undivided Attention, because um, he discusses in a really nice way how social media is exactly like that, except there's not as many like it's like death by a thousand cuts. It's like a very slow drip method of being a very unethical practice in the way that he frames it. Um, hmm. So it's a it's a nice uh, it's a nice one too to get into. That wouldn't be as easy to spot as Theranos, you know, as an example, right? But uh, how, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, ethical, let's just call it ethical philosophy inside of all the decisions being made for, for that area. So he, he uh, directed the social dilemma. Oh, okay. Oh, well. yeah. <clears throat> and that, I mean, that gets to a point that we'll talk about today too. There's, there's things that <clears throat> most of us would consider blatantly unethical. And then there's kind of, you know, ethical gray mm -hmm. area about like, Mm, you know, marketing to certain people and things like that. And does yes. that count and not? Yeah. Uh, and then after ethics would be applied ethics, which is where business ethics sits, where we take the principles of ethics and we apply them to particular areas. So, you know, famous ones would be animal ethics, whether it's the vegan and vegetarian conversation or zoos or sea world, or just what is our relation to animals? Mm -hmm. Uh, they are not persons in the same way that, that we are persons, uh, although that, that itself has come into question even recently legally. Um, environmental ethics, what's our responsibility to inanimate objects um, or, you know, living, but not, you know, uh, not conscious. Um, business ethics, medical ethics, um, you know, medical ethics example, that's famous. And again, we're not, we're not going down this rabbit hole today, but I, I TA'd for, med, I was a teaching assistant for medical ethics for a couple of semesters and um, is abortion murder? And, you know, without getting into the relevant details of it, the central philosophical question is, well, is it a person? Is it not? Is it, you know, uh, if it is a person, is it worthy of moral concern? Do the rights of the fetus person trump the rights of the do you know what i mean so it, yeah. those yeah. are the philosophical yeah. questions in there just showing you that we're trying to apply these ethical considerations to specific issues within the field but yeah that's all. yeah no I, and i think uh, using abortion is a good one because it uh it doesn't uh you know land you or i or anyone who thinks about those things in a in a bucket of um in a bucket of uh what we think you know but it but it it's, it's really intense. That's the way I describe it. And so it's a, it's a good, so you, you, it, it kind of highlights like how important the language is of applied ethical conversation, just so you don't take this ethical, 
you know, answer that you've come up with and then just throw it over into everything with regards to ethics. Like in this particular area, using something like that in abortion, it becomes uh, really intense. And that is, that's a good thing. That's a good thing for, you know, the applied ethical, um, you know, knowledge and gaining of knowledge around that. Agreed. So today we're going to talk specifically about business ethics. So, um, you know, business boiled down to its essence is an exchange, typically of money and or energy for goods and services. Um, and business ethics is concerned with how we should or should not conduct ourselves in the course of these types of exchanges. So, you know, asking questions like what is ethical and unethical in business. And um, there's, there's almost three categories here that I, I didn't quite list out now that I think about it, but perhaps I should have, you know, in, in ethics, there's the question of like, what is morally permissible? That's at one level. There's the love, there's a question of like, what is unethical? Uh, what should we forbid ourselves from doing or not, not do? And then beyond the permissible, sometimes the, the term is usually referred to as supererogatory. Uh, it's just a fancy way of saying like, what sorts of things should you do, even though they're not required, um, but they're beneficial. So the, the, un, under this umbrella would be things like, you know, giving to Oxfam or, or charity or things like that, where um, certainly it's permissible, certainly not, it's not forbidden, but like how, how much should one extend it oneself? And this is a big thing within corporate ethics too, about like, how far should a corporation or a business like extend itself into social um, uh, issues? We're seeing that today with you know the Russia situation and all these other things. Mm -hmm. So that those are those types of questions. Uh, yeah, there. yeah. Is it possible that uh, I don't know if we, if we you know um, if there's another way? I just wrote down is there is there another definition of business that would change up the angle that we're going to go about discussing business ethics today? That we just want to make sure we didn't. Uh, we didn't uh, miss out or leave out. I'm totally open to that possibility. I mean, I thought uh, I, you know, I didn't do my research to kind of like, oh, let me come up with, you know, uh, Milton Friedman, Adam Smith, you know, seven different, you know, ways of that coming about. Kind of, I didn't, I didn't for that. But uh, no, and th and this was from <clears throat> uh, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. I had a good characterization of it, and I thought that was okay. a good way to kind of classify but I, I mean I think that's totally relevant you know maybe if there's a different way of framing it that can impact yeah, yeah. So. and I wasn't doing that for the case of uh you know taking it the different route but I was just I just knew that that was going to lead into how we're determining the ethics of that business arrangement and so then I just asked the question well what happens if what you're calling the business arrangement is a little different you know from the right. start so yeah oh, that makes sense yeah so here there are some categories that we could throw things into. So things that are blatantly unethical. So, you know, to take a silly example, I can't put up on eBay a uh, auction for a date night with James. <laughs> I suppose, I suppose <laughs> I, that would be funny. <laughs> I, suppose, I suppose I could, um, but that would be- Yeah, you blatant. could. You know, that that violates your autonomy and your intention. So like, I can't like, I mean, I, I you know, we use can't in different ways, right? Like physically I, I could go in and steal mm -hmm. something from someone and like, put it up, but that, of course, that'd be unethical. And then there are yeah. things that are much more interesting that I used to talk about in my intro philosophy class that border on unethical, that we all kind of like, working at a company that makes chemical weapons, working for Philip Morris, that, you know, maybe 40 years ago wasn't considered unethical, but then became unethical. Or maybe it always won as unethical, but it wasn't societally, rec societally recognized as unethical. Or working for Pepsi or a fast food company or working for Exxon Mobil where, uh, you know, look, it's not, it, it's clearly the thing we all have to admit is it's not the direct, like they're going out and murdering someone or stealing from someone or like, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But it's, it's participating in an activity that uh, obviously can harm someone's health or the planetary health. And, you know, should we be involved with that? Should we not? So those yeah. Of yeah. I, uh, uh, did you have in that experience with those students, um, the conversation around how that borderline ethical stuff, like, uh, and, and what determines people seeping really into, oh, that's unethical. Like it, it kind of just, 
it kind of seeps its way like to being, yeah. you know, cause, cause then you could, cause that is very current for today, right? People do this like, you know, connector dots, right? Without doing the research or the background information, right? They're like, you know, the, the whoop band, you know, uh, biometric, you know, uh, venture capitalism company owned by this group, surveillance capitalism <laughs> for big pharma. And now you're connecting the whoop band to like, you know, cause I've, I've done that one, uh, for other humorous, more humorous reasons, but you know what I'm saying? So can that area, you know, uh, seep easier or what was your feedback on that or, or yeah. What? Yeah. I mean, I, I actually, I remember a specific slide that I put up discussing just this issue where it was like, um, we were talking about one's own personal integrity with regard to participating in, you know, so like, so like a famous philosophy paper, uh, topic that we, we read was about like, what if someone has an issue of conscience that goes against where they work at? And then the question is, well, if you quit, they're just going to find someone else to fill the role. But part of the point of that discussion is, well, it's not just about the action being done because the action very well may still be done, but you are not as a matter of your own integrity participating in it. So we had questions like uh, the McDonald's one is a famous one, obviously relevant for them. And um, the New York Times actually did an article on this while I was teaching the class. They interviewed the president of Notre Dame, John Jenkins, and the title of the article, which I loved, does God want you to pay $300,000 for a college education? Just like, you know, sticking yeah. it yeah. right, right in there. And uh, are they, you know, are colleges going out and killing people or stealing from people? Of course not. Um, but, you know, when you have these multi-billion dollar endowments and, you know, I mean, just mm -hmm. have gone way past the cost of inflation, like, is yeah. that unethical? And now, yeah. you know, uh, something I ran into, like, back in the 1950s and 60s, adjunct professors were 10% of the uh, professor group and they all had other jobs. And now it's like 60, 70% and they're all stringing together. So things like that, where it's not clearly blatantly unethical no one's um you know the people who sign up to be adjunct professors are voluntarily doing so. you know i mean it, it's yeah. this borderline mm -hmm. case but then it's that question of like is one's integrity being violated so th those type things mm. yeah. yeah wow um i could see uh that being uh besides being a very interesting course for a young mind of uh of helping you know, helping people come up with, you know, observing different forms of opinions, you know, and different ways of going about how to think through this thing. Um, I could see that being very challenging, though, as well, you know, super yeah. challenging to not like jump ship immediately, and like stick with it, you know, read the full article, you know, talk to John Jenkins, you know, listen, you know, like, do the do the real, the real stuff, you know, um, as we say, just do more work, like do more work in that area and, and think about it. So anyways, that's, that's, that's great. I hope, uh, hope you transform some of those minds uh, away from that, like jumping ship analogy <laughs> into I mean, like, not, well, let's think about this a little bit more. You know, they said that they ended the classes with that, right? Let's just think about it a little bit more, you know? Yeah. Like you said, I mean, if nothing else, it just gets them to think a bit more and like that directly ties into kind of what we're going to talk about today and the, politics question but also the business question of free market exchange mm. you just want to sell something should you be allowed to do it and of course we might say legally you're allowed to do it there's nothing illegal nor should there i, I personally believe and we've discussed this before i don't think there should be anything illegal about selling pepsi i don't think there should be anything illegal about selling cigarettes even though i hate them and not i'm not a big fan and aside from children of course mm -hmm. but now immoral ah now, now we have a different discussion. Yeah, now we have yeah. A different discussion. So that's yeah. that's where it comes into play. Yeah, it's legal but immoral. Yeah, <laughs> in, in, in a view, right? Yes. Or in a particular person's view. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, one question here that that I think can be relevant to what we're discussing today is, what sorts of things can and should be sold? So, on the face of it, you might think, well, this is a silly question. Um, couldn't everything be sold? But you know, when we think about it ethically, we realize, no, there's lots that can't be. So organs and blood, um, plasma can be for some reason, but blood, no. 
um, you know, our bodies, uh, interesting discussion, different places, different answers, you know, prostitution, uh, slavery, of course, is, is not as much of a discussion, rightly so. Um, we can't sell children, uh, you know, we can't sell tanks and Black Hawk helicopters to Joe Schmo down the streets. Uh, and then what about fitness and nutrition, which we'll, we'll talk about? Should, should that be a matter of commerce? Mm -hmm. Should that be the type of thing that is bought and sold or something that's just, as you've advocated for, something that's, you know, generally accessible? Yeah, uh, that's a, uh, you know, to back up before we get to the fitness thing, I just want to make mention that that's a, uh, I don't know if you see it that way, but that's just like a mantra, monstrous topic. That's like a, like a, such a, such a big topic. Correct. The, you know, just, you know, what, what things should be sold. Cause really, you know, you're going, if you're going further up from that, it does get into, um, uh, you know, Western, Western civilization and, and what are, what are the rules of law and what, what, how you're going to operate, you know, productivity from resources and how you're going to rise everyone or how you're going to, you know, figure out what it, it just seems to me like a monstrous topic. Potentially. I mean, and maybe I need to do more thinking about it too. I mean, to me, as I was writing it, my initial thought was everything should be fair game except for these things at the periphery. These, these, these things that I just mentioned, like. Yeah. Yeah. So what I meant by topic, meaning, uh, and I should put words on it, but uh, we're just saying that we're talking about econ economy and e economics here. Right. <laughs> it's just a it's just a monstrous topic. Oh That's yeah, basically yeah, what I'm saying. I, I, okay, yeah, I, yeah. yeah. In that regard, yeah, I, I see yeah. What you're saying. yeah, absolutely. Like, gosh, and uh, doesn't still discount what you meant in terms of like what you were meaning by. It. I just thought, holy cow, like there's so much in there because you just brought up a couple of bioethical things, right? Um, but yeah, anyways, yeah. And on to fitness we go. Um, I don't know if there was a question in there on that, or if you want to lead it a little differently on the, the sales and what happens inside. Maybe you can give us a little bit more forethought for uh, um, fitness business ethics. Yeah. So just just two more things I was going to mention. Then we we're going to kind of get to the um, that question about you know whether fitness should be sold. So um, you know the central aim of business, you know, kind of like you were mentioning with Milton Friedman and and others this general philosophical background that has been present, especially in the United States, but other places for the past 50, 60 years is this idea that the purpose of the business is to maximize the best interest for the shareholders. Now, obviously not everything is a public company, but the, the same type of idea where maybe it's not the shareholders, but profit, profit for the CEO. Mm -hmm. uh, and typically that's in, in, you know equated with increasing profit or wealth. But of course, how does this, this how does this vibe with like, every other title of a podcast we've had. How does this vibe with autonomy? How does this vibe with truth? How does this vibe with health? How does this vibe with ethics, the environment? Um, and with, you know, so-called conscious capitalism, you know, every other pitch you see on Shark Tank these days that's pitching to millennials. And, you know, in a lot of ways, this is a good thing. Um, you know, it's like, well, uh, we make money, but uh, we also, you know, send the 10% to the rainforest or what have you. And like, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, 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 in, I'm in favor of it, but, yeah. you know, you have this inherent tension, right? Yeah. Uh, are you a not for, for profit that's trying to help the world? Or are you like for for profit? Um, and this really kind of gets at the heart of like what is happening with the fitness business? Is it, you know, is it a business that happens to do fitness? Like it's it's trying to maximize a profit and you know, uh, you know, and create efficiency, or is it trying to you know, create truth and autonomy for individuals. You know what I mean? And those, yeah. those pull against each other. Oh, hard. hey, dude. Hard. <laughs> it's, our, hard. It's, it's our life. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's my life. <laughs> There's a big pull in there. Yeah. So yeah, for sure. Um, and then the last question before we launch into it, that just is a thought and a question that, you know, is increasingly being asked, especially after, you know, two major uh, recessions and things like that is, you know, the enterprise of capitalism, the, the very enterprise of it is that is that unethical? Um, should the government play more of a role in allocating resources to certain, you know, social goods? Or is it just, well, where the chips fall in terms of the allocation of resources? Like, if this dude over here is selling a, a fidget spinner that's making a million bucks, and this person over here is impoverished, 
well, so fall the chips of capitalism. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's kind yeah. of the question. Yeah. So, um, so fitness today for better or worse, and, you know, I know you've talked about this more than certainly more so than others, like the history of fitness, um, fitness today, whether we like it or not is a business. So, you know, when we ask about the ethics with inside it, we're talking about, you know, business ethics. So, you know, I thought maybe one question we could start with is, um, our fitness and nutrition, even the sorts of things that in an ideal world would admit of being bought and sold or matters of commerce, um, or perhaps not. So, yeah, before we get to that one, if you can remember it, I just wanted to, uh, or, or let me look ahead here. Maybe, um, yeah, maybe yeah. we're going no, to, maybe we're going to get to start with that, whichever one you'd like. Yeah. yeah so. Sorry. No, it was just, um, back to remember the original question that, uh, you, you said, or I, I was like, I'm not really sure have people in fitness, um, uh, asked these questions. So my, and, and my point was, I don't know if you remember saying like, I don't, I don't think anyways, that, uh, business ethics is directly a part of the curriculum in education for fitness coaches. That I a hundred percent agree with. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that, yeah. Uh, so I don't know if you want, if that could be a starter for us, like, well, you know, if fitness business does exist, if fitness business is under this, you know, services to individuals, we can just get into the discussion. I think, you know, the way I see what is being sold and what is being coercive versus persuasive, et cetera, based and agency, because that all fits into that, right? The, the, the rub, what we're calling it, um, is I don't think, you know, if you were to like lump them all together and generalize it, it's probably just not a lot of conversation on uh, business ethics for the people that are professionals inside of fitness, even with great intentions today. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm totally willing to admit on my end that this may be a very biased thing and you, you have, you have far more experience with a far broader swath of coaches than I do. I just know from my experience, like Brandon and I discuss this all the time and maybe okay. it's the fact yeah. that we're like, yeah. you know, um, you know, within this milieu and we like to, you know, ask these deeper questions. Um, now so. business ethics or fitness business ethics? Uh, fit, fit, fitness business ethics. Okay. I mean, obviously general questions about like what's right about marketing, but yeah, mo mostly related to fitness business ethics, like to what extent should, you know, uh, to take an example, like in business, one of the ways you sell things is to feign scarcity oh mm. sign up now a few spots left um uh but is that is that ethical is that right and you know mm. creating an urgency when maybe there isn't an urgency on a part of a client um or creating, maybe there's lots of spots left yeah maybe there's lots of spots left and maybe you know selling the six-week thing so that it's the entree to them but it's also the cool snappy you know what i mean like as opposed mm. to the lifelong journey so all, all the stuff that we so you guys discuss that a lot or you guys think about those yeah Got frequent, it. very frequent. Yeah. yeah, well, um, yeah, I think I just need to do a better, uh, like I just need with regards to numbers, really. But uh, I think it's just a, a ton that don't, you know, that don't uh, have those discussions or have that conversation. Yeah, yeah. which which doesn't, you know, land us in bedrock, you know, for, for where we are for fitness business ethics in our conversation today. But um, maybe it's like a, it's a inspiring note for individuals to not only get deep into the weeds, which we're going to on particular topics inside of fitness business ethics, but just keep, you know, saying, asking yourself these, um, you know, uh, applied ethics conversation Yeah. in fitness. And again, this is a limited perspective, but from, you know, some of the business courses we've taken and fitness business courses, you know, a general, this, there seems to be, at least among some people, us included, a general malaise around this idea of like, um, you know, the very notion of like sales and objection handling and, oh, call your wife. You yeah. Know, you know what I mean, like yeah. Those, yeah. Those, those, those types of things that seem to really border on um, unethical just for the sale when you're trying to treat, teach like truth and autonomy and longevity. So, 
just kind of this push and pull between what is needed to operate something so that you can even do the thing you want to do. Yeah. Uh, versus like the truth within that, that thing that you're trying to do. So, yeah, yeah, no, I, uh, yeah, those are great examples of, uh, some of the, you know, meandering, I guess we can call it around that relationship and conversation. And I, I love backing up with those individuals like we do in our education. This is where we'll, we'll pump our own style of that for the education of the coach. The first thing that we start with is, you know, indirectly it's, it's this question, what do you think is the best pathway for people in this world of fitness? And then we say, well, what do you think that could look like? And then how do you think they should be treated for their assessment? And then how well they can adapt to these new things and move forward. You know, so we, we go after, you know, uh, indirectly this conversation on which we like, we stretch it out to a language, right? Download all this shit as an adult over three years and then be on your way and work out on your own. Like that, that's the short version of what we'd like right. to see it all get to. Um, and, and then, yeah, then you're met with this, like, well, I can't make, I can't, I can't assume that everyone's going to know how to just like do that. So how do I share this knowledge with individuals? And that's where it lands. That's where, that's where our conversation, quote unquote, on the professional or business is towards the end because we want people then at that point in time, which I'm thinking, just back thinking, we probably should do a little bit more of a conversation from my responsibility on the tie in to ethics on the front end inside of that autonomy conversation to the back end of the fitness professional. I digress, but that's why we do that towards the end of our education. Um, you know, so people can say, okay, you know, it's 2022. Uh, everyone who comes in front of me, you know, in, in large way, shape or form uh, thinks about this for fitness, you know, and now you're left with like, well, <laughs> it's a business it's business <laughs> so if it is business then what do i need to do and and now you come down to these tough questions which are great you know um how hard do you believe in autonomy you know how hard do you believe in it and how hard do you want to push that and wrap it inside of this you know uh ethical movement of uh of you know taking this information and sharing with other people so that they can download and become autonomous and and uh, move forward. Yeah, definitely. And I think the way you framed it is important. And that, I mean, that, that very notion of like three years and then they go do on their own is like, if we, it's not an either, or there's a sliding scale of like, let's say, you know, all business, no regard to truth or anything else is over here. And like autonomy, truth, virtue is over here. Like um, that even that attitude is very much closer to the truth, autonomy, virtue side than it is to the business side, because of course, with business, especially today, the Holy grail is right. Recurring revenue subscription, right? Mm, yeah. Get them, get them hooked yeah. for life. But that's what I said, 2022. I mean, that's just, yeah. That's it, right. So, you know, the very notion of like, oh, you will be done with this person after a while rather than like, oh, Hey, how can I rope you into, you know, more back and coming back and coming back and coming back. Yeah. Um, I think where I personally, I mean, I, you know, my views are evolving on this, I, I think, but if I'm, if I'm putting my own particular view on the table, I think the unethical aspect comes when there's an element of either coercion or creating a faux need, um, for something I don't currently think, and I'm willing to be challenged on this. I think if someone chooses, you know, after full well knowledge and all the rest of that stuff that they like having a coach or want to continue with that. Um, I don't, I certainly don't think that's unethical. It may not be ideal. Um, but I think where the real unethical aspect comes in is where, you know, there's this, uh, creation of a need that maybe doesn't exist just for the yeah. purpose of creating profit. That's, that's unethical. Yeah. That, that I'm willing to put, you know, a stamp on. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like, uh, you know, your business, uh, doctrine being about unsustainability, you know, and what's on your door. And then now you're saying, well, to the people that are in front of you, we actually would like you to sustain, you know, and there's lots of nuance in that and grayness in it, you know? Um, and if you have that business on your door, you know, you may not see it as being unethical when you, when you stretch that puppy out really long and hard just based upon your, your previous point, right? 
Um, are you being coercive? That, that's up for grabs. That's up for an argument. Um, you know, because you'd, you'd have to be like, well, the doctrine does say that, but that's not what we do here. Okay, you know, fine. <laughs> you know, tell me, tell me otherwise. Um, and then they're squabbling around the philosophy of the, the practices and et cetera. You know, what that looks like, virtuosity and movement, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I uh, I got I got distracted by that for thinking of the current the current public's perception, right? Of what they're told is the vision of fitness by people. You know, I tried to put myself into the public's position and say these these figures of authority, right? Because that's where the question comes in: Is this co coercive versus is this persuasive? You know. Are, what are they persuading me towards? And to your point, I agree. If there's persuasion towards something that full well knowing the people that are selling it, they know it's not attracted anyone whatsoever to define method of independency and autonomy downstream, then I'm considering it unethical. Yeah, because they know, right? The, 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 the people that are pushing that idea, they know. And if you do know, right? If, if you have great argument to, to it inside there, which I have lots of times, you mean indirectly with you and CCP coach, et cetera, which is great debate on that of this autonomy and the knowledge of, and, you know, if they don't know, well, how do they get to knowing, et cetera, that that's a good one. Right. Uh, but if you do know there is this something and the, we, you do believe in that, that something can be learned. Let's just call it fitness for short term and can be learned over time. That certainly helps them. Then I think, we have, to, we have to be honest by saying there is one point in time where the business relationship ends, you know, and then maybe work our way backwards from that. You know, again, it comes down to the, you know, three-year mark, you know, maybe it's 12 years. I don't know. You know, I'm just saying is that at least there's like something where that, where, where that does end. And um, yeah, I'm just uh, throwing out what, what's on the top of my head based upon what you had said. Or... I, actually, I, have a, I have a question there that I, I think we discussed, maybe it was like on episode three when we were discussing autonomy that, that I've been thinking more about. And I brought up the fact that I thought there might be a distinction between the nutrition version of this and the fitness version of it. I, I feel like I might have a better way of characterizing it, but I'm, I'm curious your thoughts. So yeah. to me, when I do the nutrition side of stuff, again, barring any FDN or functional level stuff, for the most part, after a year, it's like, okay, You've got your habits, you've got your quality. We've done some stuff on quantity. Like mm -hmm. you're, you're good to go, right? Yeah. Like we, we, don't, we don't need to do too much more than that. On the fitness side, I've, I've heard you say things to the effect of, and I generally tend to agree, um, always trying to get to that like 90 to 95 of like challenging where you're at. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Throughout mm -hmm. your life, not, not, in, not in like a CrossFit, like throw yourself on the floor, but just like, hey, if you did this before, like, hey, let's keep pushing yeah. that. So to me, and again, I could be wrong here, but I wonder on the fitness side of things, if someone doesn't have any inherent knowledge of um, programming, which they just don't need at a certain point on the fitness side, it's just rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. You're not challenging yeah. anything. You don't need to go beyond. Yeah. Um, is there a use case for a coach in that where they can actually help you keep challenging? Does that make sense at all? Am, am I? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I think what you're talking about there is, the assumed, you know, lack of knowledge that the client that you're, per, you're, you're assuming they may have around potential and capability and how to continue to progress towards that highest level of potential. Is that correct? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Well, if not, um, I, I really do think that it's, it's probably like the reason why it's not obvious and that it happens all the time now is, is not because what some people may think it's more complex and therefore needing some, someone to kind of guide them through that is that we just haven't created great language that would make it simple to understand just like you did with nutrition with people on eat this amount and quality, whatever. So that's what, what I'm working on. So, so meta wise, the fact you're asking the question is a great continual, you know, requirement for me to upgrade my language to make that more simple. 
and I do believe it is the case with regards to fitness in general. We're just calling fitness right now physical challenges, just so people are like, well, what do you mean? Well, physical challenges, uh, people can't determine how to, you know, and I'm sorry I put on that face, but it's, it's always the question. That, uh, people can't do that by themselves. You know, there's no way they'll know how to progress this thing over time. Well, that means you just got to give them like give them a printout or give them pictures or like say over time, you know, you're going to feel this and this is how you're going to progress that. So it's, it's not too much more than that, you know, it, it, and if you're like, well, it needs to be colored a little bit more. Okay. Maybe it is, but you know, you just give them these things like, you know, variety, consistency, you know, timelines, which I've done in my more recent learn RX, you know, product placement, learn RX, uh, patterns and paces, uh, conversation, right? So, uh, it, 30 seconds, just, you know, get tired in 30 seconds. So that right there, you know, doesn't say a lot, but at least it's, it's an injection of simple language that people can chew on for 40 years, right? Because you could do 40 years, three times a week of resistance and 30 seconds will indirectly be challenging enough to get to that 90%. You know, you can't, and I don't, I don't have to go more depth to that, but um, anyways, I appreciate the question because it, I, I have to keep working on, you know, making individuals, you know, create that connection between, you know, what, what people just did for physical challenges. And, you know, I just took down a date, uh, you know, the, I think, I think the pre personal trainer era is a great split place to go to, to ask these questions on business ethics and autonomy and fitness. And I just chose 1968 post civil, civil, uh, disobedience era and moving into some like, okay, well, this is civility. Um, you know, I think that, um, that would be a time to kind of say, you know, well, what were people doing for physical challenges and, and how much knowledge did they need to attain to create great levels of resistance for the rest of their life? And there, 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 there wasn't a lot that people thought you necessarily had to attain. This is why from my background knowledge, and I, I should do a better job of this over time of giving people that historical context. But, you know, this, like what you see here, this profession, you know, you could probably, <laughs> you're probably, what is it? What's the philosopher's historical context in a profession? Holy shit oh, yeah. balls, right? Oh, yeah. Like, wow. But this, what you see here, James Fitzgerald, like it's only 40 years old. Like you know, we need to really think about that, right? So that came into being because of this investigation into science around the body. We're like, oh, the body. And then this whole context of like, well, what do we do socially? And this ad, you know, industry was bubbling up and et cetera. And this whole swarm of less activity, right? And more things met, you know? And so we created this whole concept. We should probably study the body and physical expression, et cetera, and this is where it went, dot, dot, dot. We needed an academia. We need to set these people up for vocation to ensure that they could pass along this knowledge. So that is the history of it. Back to my point, I think about 1968 and say, you know, it wasn't really that hard <laughs> to, to, to uh, gain this concept. They're like, oh, I don't know what you do. You just play stick ball in the street. <laughs> and then uh, and I just run around and, you know, I lifted things and, hey, you know, I'm doing okay. Etc. Um, and so I didn't need a really lengthy, really lengthy career of, for five years, right? Four times a week um, in this real estate location with this machinery uh, to like become enlightened, to, to really like take it to the next level. I, I didn't need that. So, but this is where this is where we land, the way I see it. It's 2022, and um, you know, you have two generations deep now since Gen X, right? Uh, that 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 see that see this fitness thing, right? Of something that's not like what it once was, and this is the contention, right? This is the, it's like yeah, but you could you could say James that people are just going to come out of the womb and just like no to do physical challenges, um, but there's so many things going against that. Their parents don't don't believe in that as, as just like day-to-day -day stuff. Their parents think that you need to have a trainer. 
you know, their parents, your, their parents think that you need to be educated in university to teach people about fitness. Like it's, it goes, it goes deep. And that is essentially what brings us to our conversation today and why it's so, it's so difficult for me to even have a conversation on fitness business ethics, because I really do think that the physical expression and physical challenges, as I've said many times before, could just be quote unquote taught you know, and then we can get into conversations on freedom of, you know, knowledge and, and get into that area um, that uh, people can just maintain good physical resilience for their life. And there's no need for what we see right now in terms of fitness. And the way I see it personally is just a re it's just a rehabilitative model to fix a whole lot of things um, with some instances, the Robbies and Brandon, <laughs> some instances of people that are just you know, have bigger brains was the saying they have bigger brains, but they didn't let it fall out of their head. <laughs> They're crit critically thinking um, about like, yeah, okay, that is true. But what do we go? How do we go about doing what's in front of us? You know? Yeah. So sorry, that was lengthy, but that kind of summarizes the, my perspective on that. And maybe it'll take us in a direction here that helpful to what you had on, on tap. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. And yeah, I mean, I, I am getting a better understanding again with what you said uh, Wednesday in your talk about, you know, I, I think sometimes coaches run into, and I, I mean, just to be clear, I have no pony in the race about like, obviously from my nutrition years before CCP, I'm totally familiar with the idea of like, yeah, one and done. That's the whole goal. Like I, I have no pony for people to be recurring, but I, but I do. Yeah. I, I did wonder like, okay, well, if they've never taken CCP before and like, and they want to like, keep touching that level of resistance, like as they get to 60 and 70, like doing a three by five with the same weights, like that isn't going to, well, I could be wrong, but I don't, I don't think that's going to do the trick. So like, yeah, uh, wondering what sort of thing would be necessary, but you talking about how there could be a, you know, life gain or life sustain kind of template for them to then self progress should they choose um, yeah. is helpful. Um, I do think one, you know, one topic that we've kind of touched on a little bit before, but I think is especially relevant in business ethics that we could touch on is this dichotomy again between like, and this is a spectrum between like wants on one side and needs on the other. So like yeah. pure business perspective would be give the people what they want as long as it is, you know, and uh, I'm we, triggered. I know. I, well, I know. Cause we have the soundbite. I forget what episode it was like, give the people what they want. You, know, you said it like 18, 20 times in like an incredulous, sarcastic fashion. No, <laughs> no. Um, uh, so yeah, like, I, so, you know, on the pure business side with want, it's like barring any violation of any ethical principles, lying, killing, stealing, what have you. Yeah. If someone wants it, okay, go, go get, give it to them. Uh, you know, have you ever seen these things on YouTube? The, uh, the mukbangs, it sounds like a oh. dirty, thing, but it's, it's well, okay, it, but it, it's not It's well, I guess somewhat it basically on YouTube, one of the most popular genres is people eating, like it, it, it's from the Korean word mukbang it basically just means like you watching someone eating these grotesque amounts of food like flaming hot cheetos or pizza or what have you oh, it's like, like fair factor on steroids yeah but you're just like watching them eat this for like 30 minutes and like some of those and like that that's a good example it's like wait why this isn't healthy for them this is great you know or like dr pimple popper i mean just just weird like how is this popular how is this a thing but like eh, it doesn't violate any ethical rules people like it you know, the market dictates that it's popular, so on and so forth. That's one end of the spectrum. Yeah. And then the other end of the spectrum is, you know, need and what and what should be happening. And in the fitness conversation, you know, um, you know, there's a whole lot of the want. And I, I, I I'd add to what you said before, like, I, I do think there's definitely blame to be placed on the part of unethical fitness trainers trying to hawk something. But I'd just like in the prescription medication discussion, I'd, I'd, I'd squarely place the blame on the shoulders of individuals too. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it, it isn't just doctors and insurance. No, it's a balance people. in there. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. people, people want the quick fix. Like yeah. it, you know, look in the mirror. Like that's, that's where that comes from. It's not just some dude down the street trying to hawk F45 or orange theory. Like it's there partially because individuals are like, well, what can I do? That's, that's uh, super quick. So that that's the business ethical discussion where it's like, on the one hand, yeah, give the people what we want. Like Brandon and I say all the time, like the business could be making so much more money 
if we uh, sold supplements, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? But we refuse to, and we, we, don't, yeah. we don't want, you know what I mean? So it's that, it's that dichotomy between the want and the need. And, you know, OPEX is very far on the side and most fitness things are on the side, but um, yeah, I don't know if you wanted to talk about kind of that, that dichotomy, that push and pull between what business dictates about what we should be providing to people and what they want versus what they need and how that fits into the business of fitness. Yeah, yeah. I think the uh, uh, book that I read, Why We Are Restless, summarizes it in multiple different ways, you know, at uh, to, your, to your point of like, you know, <laughs> you, you're not making sense of why people would watch that for 30 minutes. To me, that does make sense based upon um, just, you know, quote unquote, this collective stress inside of society when those when those things are really high um you're you're not focused on watching those things you know you're focused on things that are, are more meaningful so basically summarizing it is that it makes sense to me that people are doing that because they don't have they don't have better things to do like if you got a lot of time on your hands you know and you want to watch things i mean it's right in front of you but what happens if you who and you, if people don't ask the question who's not watching these individuals right i can tell you who's not watching these individuals those those fucking guys out there 10 hours in the sun every day for for six days a week right so that that's who's not watching that my whole point being is that they got shit to do right and then you can get into the conversation on you know what is contributive and what is just fucking folly and luxury luxury things that people may have the um yeah the 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 the, the business ethics one in the end of you know giving people what they want versus what they need I, th I think it still comes down to, um, yeah, that challenge of the rub between the, the coach knowing, right? If the coach knows, and, and that will probably never be unfolded. Like if the coach knows, um, then you're always going to be stuck with that. I've said this over and over again, OPEX and the concept, you know, and the concept, um, which I could describe in much more detail to help, but the concept in how it's applied in business will in the definition of business never be successful never be successful i of course have to define what success means right if you're talking about success for 10,000 people over 60 years okay you know well what did you find by sex the sec success in that you know, indirectly sex was inside of there. Well, they're capable of being resilient and reproducing. No, like we, we've turned those individuals into critical thinkers and autonomous human beings that could go and contribute to society, think clearly and help others, right? So that's what I think we've done. But with regards to, you know, a defining factor of shareholder value increases and, you know, net profits and et cetera, we are fucking horrible. We're fucking horrible. Like we're we're like we're like fifteen thousandth on the list, you know, of a blog that says what are the top fitness companies, you know what I'm saying? So that's a reality, you know. And but that defines your continuum there, right? So if you want to go after, you know, the truth, right? Just fucking lift rocks and be in the sun. It comes back to our, it comes back to our, you know, the 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 folly conversation too, right? It's like that stuff is not sexy. It's fucking, you know, and how do you, how do you move people towards recognizing that? I think more of the problems are, you know, what I see anyways, Robbie, is that a lot of coaches are not willing to even, even think about that concept, right? They just, they just become this abrupt, that doesn't, that works against my biases mechanism. They just like stop, right? And they don't want to like keep, keep working through that. Um, and I understand, <laughs> I get it. I'm, I'm, I, I have a lot of care for those people too. They have good, they're well-intentioned humans, right? But they just don't want to keep going with that. Um, and so inside a business, then, yeah, you're going to end up if you want to, you know, sell those basic things versus, you know, the which I think is a is a tremendous help to me for today to spend more time in the conversation on this like continuum. Uh, because it's not a demarcation, right? Between <laughs> this this holy grail and like this nonsense, right? Um, let's call it what you know, let's let's call it let's put a name on it, right? Um, F45, right? Or Orange Theory, right? And then let's come over here and just say OPEX, right? There's there is like these in between things, and I think there's 
I'll say it again, a very, very low percentage, I would even say into the single digits, right? You included that are, are inside here well-intentioned saying this is modern times, you know, and then let's, let's, we, 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 yeah, I get that. I get that. But there's modern times and this is what we're going to work with. Right. And you're, you're kind of like airing and pushing towards that side. And so nothing inside of there could ever be argued as unethical because you know, right. Cause you know, you have the knowledge of like, what is, but you're also meeting people where they're at of, you know, <laughs> just what their, what their brains say, right. They're like, <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> I need this. <laughs> uh, and so we have fitness business, right? You have fitness business. You're essentially taking this real elongated approach to breaking dependency, right? Breaking dependency and creating autonomy. And inside of that, it takes business to do it. But ironically, at least in the case of what you were talking about, like the fitness business for the long-term goal of ending fitness business, right? Yeah. <laughs> in, in a certain, in a certain yeah. sense. Yeah. Uh -huh. to, to kind of breaking those uh, chains. But I, no, I think that's a good point in the, um, you know, I think in a lot of ways what you, you guys at CCP and, or at OPEX and coaching CCP have to deal with in terms of dealing with, um, coaches and kind of steering the conversation towards like what would this even look like if people were fully autonomous is analogous to what coaches have to deal with with clients of like well I want to guide you toward this thing but I have to meet you here and like we got to kind of lead it along and that that really is where I think a lot of the ethical considerations come in about like to what extent can I give some people some of what they want to have the discussion about what they need and like what's permissible and what's not. And, you know, should I be shoving something down their throat about something they don't care about? Or, you know, like all these questions about like, what can I give them? What should I give them? How much should I educate them? How much should I not? Yes, they want this, but they really need this. So I think there's a lot of interesting ethical conversations within that about um, what coaches should should do. Oh, for sure. And we, you know, I, I, I do this every time at the beginning of CCP for the first two calls where that language is inside of that. And that takes hours. And I can tell you, I probably get into 10% of the minds of that idea. Like, how do you, how do you formulate these questions on the front end, right? Um, around like, you know, I, I kind of put it into more humorous terms, right? <laughs> where at the end of the call, the first call, you can imagine all these coaches, right? A hundred coaches are in front. They're like, yeah, the secret sauce, you know, <laughs> at the end of that first call, they're like, um, uh, what? Like how, so <laughs> I got a business, you know, <laughs> um, because they then know they're like, oh gosh, I do know that. And, and then of course they see it in themselves too, right? They're like, oh gosh, like I got to fix that own thing about me. I never, I never thought about fitness that way. Um, but, and just to keep going on your point, uh, uh, and the reason why I give those personal experiences inside of CCP, these questions are being asked, right? They are being asked. And, uh, and those, those are challenging. Like, what is, how do we go about? And so anyways, to try to get to it that people can leave with as an idea is just don't hesitate to bring up uh, conceptual ideas, right? Bring up ideas like, uh, you know, just because I know of this, this is the coach talking now to the new client, just because I know about this and we have the time to discuss it, right? What's your thoughts on, on learning about this physical fitness thing, you know, and getting to the point sometime down the road where you know about it so well that you could just operate it, you know, every day yourself, like, so, and, and we talk about those things, right? And I, I, I say that five different ways, Robbie, because I can tell the first time I say it, it's like, I, know, I, can't, I can't imagine ever asking that to someone, right? I can't imagine even reaching that in, in, in conversation. And so I'm just mentioning those things to say that, you know, just don't hesitate to, to get into that more challenging area. And then to the point of our conversation today, if this is still like I like I end the call with, I'm not like, listen, you're still going to go out and do your job, you know, <laughs> just go back and do your job. Right. Um, but now, you know, right. And that's my point to getting to like the select few, 
You know, it's, it's the ones who know, right? At least, you know, and so now, you know, and now you can work with modernity, right? This, this is what, this is what we got in front of us. And then we can talk about systems and talk about like how to put it into place and all the challenges around the questions we want to ask and et cetera, right? Is, is broccoli better than cauliflower, right? We all know the answer to that one. There's no, there's, it's not even. I'm going to well from you know, question. <laughs> They get on that first call and they're like, wait, I thought we were going to talk about pain and macros. Uh, uh, <laughs> that was not that conversation. Or even, even anti-pain, right? Yeah. Even, is, even that's expected now. They're like, ooh, you know, with popcorn, Michael Jackson meme for me to talk about CrossFit for, for two hours, right? Yeah. And they're like, how did this turn into me taking a deep dive into myself being dependent on another coach for exercise? It's like, What? You know, I thought I heard him say <laughs> that someone could just like do push-ups every second day and live a virtuous like I don't he didn't say that, did he? It was like rewind, repeat, and watch that one over and over. Yeah. No, Which, by the way, that. I don't say that, but it's yeah. it's framed in that way to get people like, hey, you know, uh without you know getting really <laughs> I just ran, I'm sorry to go off on that one, but it's inside the fitness business ethics. I think this is actually a fitness, it's a, there's a fitness business ethical conversation in here on a, should I be telling this to people? <laughs> is that unethical? Well, to that, I would say it's legal, but possibly immoral. So I start with, uh, you know, that point of, of a couple of times ago, and then half an hour and I was like, I got to switch. But anyways, I started with, and I think it was the energy of the day. Maybe I did like some back squats in the morning, or whatever. But I talked about this whole uh, deconstruction scenario, deconstruction scenario of fitness. <laughs> I laid the land for like, rip the whole thing down, tear it apart. And wh what would we all do with that? And how would that build up proper principles, right? The whole deconstruction, deconstruction methodology and, and theory. It's kind of interesting if you just apply it to like fitness, right? Because it gets into this discomfort around reformation versus radicalization versus re-education etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh, <laughs> you know, oh, man, don't do that if you have <laughs> willing people in front of you for uh for a business bit a future fitness business i wouldn't start with that one yeah didn't go a good opener yeah i mean it's it's yeah <laughs> i just think of jim carrey at the party <laughs> You know, I should have came in with the, you know, ripping people's hearts out and everyone laughing, you know, kind of thing. That's, I took his idea into every call from thereafter. It's like, whoa, 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 right? You know, you got to come in jovial. Anyways, be more ethical. Be a little more ethical on that one, that approach. I don't know if you guys have a cohort starting around April 1st or not, but I feel like another way you could throw people off is like mixed modal doesn't get its due. <laughs> you know, the high intensity model, the 10 general physical <laughs> skills. <laughs> just... Go back around. <laughs> oh man. Or I could just have me, you know, this is even, this is even deeper, darker than that. Bring in an old 2008 video and just have me, you know, screaming, you know, in there of all the, the prophecies of what we're learning about this whole CrossFit expedition, you know, that, that would be like a, a tear jerker. There's tear a power uh, jerker. There's a, there's a series from, I think it's Vanity Fair where like for Billie Eilish, they've, they've done like a yearly interview every single year for the past five years where they ask the same question and they kind of, oh. you know, you see, you see these cool. updated answers about yeah. like, you know, life purpose and what, yeah. what would you say to previous Billy? And, you know, so I could just imagine, you know, James from, uh, oh, man. early games champion years. Yeah. What would you say to younger James, James? <laughs> <laughs> I've asked, I've been asked that one numerous times on podcasts and that's it in different ways. So I think, I think we've kind of hit the, um, you know, we've, we've talked a bit about like, ethical versus unethical practices to a certain extent within fitness. And obviously it's a, it's a big topic, but I, one, one topic I thought would be kind of cool to maybe talk about a little bit in the remaining time here is, um, so we were talking before about 
in ethics, there are things that are permissible, things that you that are ethically permissible that right they're they're not problematic in any way. And then there's unethical, but then there's the supererogatory. There's the things that like, do we do we actually owe something beyond just mm -hmm. not being unethical? So like one yeah. one question I thought we could maybe discuss is. You know, there's lots of questions these days around like corporate responsibility and things like that. And, you know, there are larger discussions, obviously, around like social movements and, you know, boycotting because of Russian actions and things like that. But I, I was thinking more along the lines of like, what, if any, societal responsibilities do corporations like, uh, you know, OPEX or Orange Theory, you know, all, all these different yeah. business corporations have to society at large? Yeah. Um, and what, what we're trying to build for the future aside from just kind of maximizing profit. I don't know if you have any thoughts there. One yeah. Way. Yeah. Well, um, I just had it down there as to like, well, what do you do? You know, just thinking in my position, what kind of things am I, am I trying to do without even thinking that they are either right or wrong or best or better. Um, but there has to be continued energy on, uh, criticizing bad ideas. That's my view, you know, and, and that can be done very professionally and ethically um, because it does at least raise, you know, conversation on, well, who is in this room with regards to, you know, what a fitness business should be, what a fitness coach's long-term trajectory should be, you know, et cetera. And then say, well, this is what these people think, you know, um, and this is what, why I disagree with that. And the reason why I think inside of fitness, why that's important is that there's no public space or like a public square situation in our profession, like there could be in multiple other professions, right? And I know there's conversation that is very argumentative and agreeable on my behalf of like siloing and, you know, think tanks being right or left, et cetera. I get it, but there's, there's you know, since the advent of the internet and social media, et cetera, um, fitness would be lumped into that area. There's no public space for this like back and forth conversation. It's the sole, the sole thing, not the sole thing, but a lot of it is just on gaining attention and selling people to that particular idea. That's the general generalized consensus. I could stretch that a little bit further, but, um, but that I think needs to be quote unquote, a part of the long-term strategy for your question on what do we owe, right? We owe to the entire fitness collective to criticize bad ideas, then maybe I need to find better language for that. So people don't get triggered just based upon it being like, you know, a pacifist or just being, you know, ah, I just don't want to do that. It's important that we have debate and conversation on what we think would be right. Um, I think we owe it to the public uh, to have conversations on autonomy. I think we owe it to the public. So that may, that may not give you an answer to the question on like, supererogatory, I apologize, I don't know how to pronounce it correctly, but uh, like what, what is, what's above that ethical thing or something that we can use as a beacon? Um, I think we owe it to people to somehow, some way in shape or form through diagrams or images or what's on our business door or what's on our web page or how we have conversations with individuals. We wanna talk about autonomy in different ways like this. You know, if you, in case no one's still getting it after all my episodes, oh, sorry, all of our episodes and my conversations on that, talk about learning. What does learning mean to you? Like ask that to a client. And I think with the, you know, to, to put language on it, I have visions and dreams that make me feel really good of some of the current things that I'm doing that are observable and measurable as a business and as a human that make me feel good. Um, let's call them philanthropic behind the scenes kind of things that I would love every fitness professional to get to so that they can contribute back or like, you know, you know, get into specific areas and help people that may not have that like open eyed opportunity or accessibility to that knowledge or et cetera. I'm currently doing that. But as I'm saying that, um, man, it, it's, it's almost it's almost impossible based upon the system that we're in to build up all these business systems, which I would, I would even argue that probably maybe uh, before the, if the recession, if the 2008 thing didn't happen, you would probably have uh, arguably, this is an interesting philosophical, you know, um, or metaphorical, you know, way of thinking about things like 
what would, you know, how would all the CrossFit gyms collectively contribute, you know, 2012, 2013, with like 10 years in now of like 20,000 affiliates around the world, right? So just think about that. Now, regardless of your philosophy of what happens inside, et cetera, you know, you know, and others would know, there's lots of cash to go around if that thing is done legally and morally, right? Around teaching people around fitness. Now, I don't want to get into quantum, <laughs> but just think about that. Now, what you want to use, just think about that as an analogy of like how awesome that would have been, where all these people would have this net profit with good intentions, right? You know what they would have been doing? They would have seeped into public education, right? They would have had like fitness in a hundred words up around the community. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's what would have been, that's what would have happened, right? I'm, and that's just the metaphorical idea of it. Um, but that can't happen to my point on, you know, what, what uh, your question on, you know, how can we, how can we get to the point or what do we owe? Um, Businesses can't get there. Humans can't get there. You know, we just can't make enough money over time to actually like tiptoe into this long-term mastery idea in terms of fitness business of, you know, what we can see books behind me written on like, well, this is what you do when you make a billion dollars and you're 33, right? Give 99% of your wealth away over to, you know, it's like, man, that's so fantasy based, right? I can't fucking, you know, I can't fucking buy avocados. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's so far removed from you know, that, that deep contribution or owing into it. And fitness businesses in my lifetime will never get there. We'll never get there where we could like have well-intentioned people with a lot of, a lot of capital to, to, to make, you know, make some shakes and um, not make shakes. I, shouldn't use, I don't know why I thought shakedowns, but um, like to really make some movement, right? Yeah, movement and create like this, uh, this jam on the, quote unquote, I know it's just for current use today, but underserved or um, population that just, just can't get access to this knowledge around it. So sorry, that was lengthy. I hope it, I hope it answered somewhat of your questions of owing. Yeah. No, you, you did. I mean, and it was helpful to have that distinction. I mean, even though it's not exactly what any of us would like to think or hear, but it's, it's real. It's, you know, some of those owing things are things we can and should do and as you were saying towards the end there's some of them are things that we should do but perhaps aren't necessarily going to have the capital or profit to be able to you know affect massive societal change at that at that level yeah yeah and so, that's why i push hard on the uh the knowledge of that fitness being free over time you know and whether i'm right or wrong like trying to get that into young minds i think that's a that's something that's not a big costly endeavor it's just that um, there's so many impeding things that uh, people just don't want to have that happen. Right. And the very enterprise of business itself applied to fitness would say otherwise, right? Like, and this is why I went back to de deconstruction, which wasn't yeah. the good route. <laughs> yeah. You get tomatoes thrown at you? Or... <laughs> well, I don't know. I was just going to check on Zoom if it's possible because they were, they were missing out as reactions if, uh, if they didn't do that. That's funny. Anyhow. All right. Well, I know we got to go time wise. So I'll wrap up here real quick. Um, yeah. yeah. Today we discussed business ethics. Uh, we situated it within the project of meta ethics, ethics, and applied ethics. Um, we talked about how the very enterprise of business and this notion of making a profit can sometimes go against things like truth and autonomy and virtue. And how do we balance that as coaches? And how do we teach that to um, clients in a way that's um, ethical and not violating our own integrity. And then, you know, towards the end there, we were talking about what sort of things do we owe to society as fitness coaches and uh, fitness individuals and, you know, to the fitness collective to, to change things for the better. Yeah. And not just on that, because I picked up a lot of things throughout and I thank you for that is uh, to spend a little bit, you know, sometimes someone needs to propose an idea and a framework so that people can get behind it. I think I need to do a better job of proposing that long-term philanthropic concept inside of fitness, even regardless of it being possible for people. But I just don't think it's quite possible in some people's minds because no one has ever discussed the vision of it. So I'll work on that. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Uh, thank you for this today. Um, and as always, um, we'll see you on the uh, next one.
Thank you. See you on the next one.